Hello and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Canon AE-1 program. It was launched in 1981 and was an update to the at that time five year old Canon AE-1. So can you guess the main difference between the AE-1 program and the earlier AE-1? That's correct. The later camera has this bolt-on finger grip which uh, personally I think makes the camera look a little bit nicer but it also greatly improves the ergonomics of the camera gives you something to grasp onto and with the wind-on standoff really makes it uh, a comfortable camera to use. Of course we shouldn't overlook the fact that the AE-1 program also adds program exposure mode which in 1981 was still quite a, an advanced and innovative feature to the specification of shutter speed, priority and manual on the earlier camera. So with that said, let's take a closer look. So when we look at the top plate, over here on the right we have the main power control as they call it. Lock meaning basically off. Uh, and on this camera it is a true power off battery disconnected feature. It completely disconnects the battery, even the battery test doesn't work, so there's no power going through to any circuit board at all. Moving this up to A, turns the camera on. Uh, there's some discussion as to what A might mean, whether it's active or activate or action. In the instruction book it simply describes this setting as the A setting. So to access the main feature of the AE-1 program, which is the program exposure, we need to turn this dial, the shutter speed dial, to the program setting. And you can see there's a little black index mark just here. Again, I'm uh, doing this from behind a video camera, which makes life a little bit tricky. And we need to make sure that the lens is set to the green A setting. So you'll see that that and the program mode are color coordinated in that green setting. So in program, in principle, all I need to do is compose, focus, and press the button. And I'll get a correctly exposed photograph every time, in principle. Now just because we have this fully automatic exposure mode, it doesn't excuse us as photographers from being aware of our subject and possible issues that might arise. So for example, if I'm photographing green grass, grey concrete, a mid-toned car, blue, red, grey, that sort of thing, the centre-weighted average metering system in the camera is going to work perfectly well. But if I'm photographing a landscape with a significant amount of sky, or I'm photographing a bride in a white wedding dress, or I'm photographing a group of people in dark or black clothing, the camera is going to try and render all of those subjects as a mid-tone grey. So with our landscape and our bride, we're going to get underexposure. And with a group of people in dark clothing, we're going to get overexposure. So we need to be aware of that, and, and Canon are obviously aware of that. And so they've provided the means to correct for those unusual exposure situations uh, in the form of a button on the side. So you can see there's two buttons just on the side here. Uh, one has a silver ring around it and one is plain black. It's the top one, the plain black one that we're interested in here. That is the auto exposure lock button. So if I'm photographing a landscape, I can focus on my landscape, which will not be normally that way of course. In fact if I do this this way around we get a better impression of what I mean. So I've set my focus and I know that the sky is going to com cause confusion with the exposure. So I'm going to tilt the camera down to exclude the sky from what I'm looking at. And normally I'd use my index finger of course. I'm going to push the auto exposure lock button in, recompose and take the picture. So this button will lock the exposure at whatever you're pointing it at at this moment. So when you recompose, uh, the sky coming back into the scene doesn't confuse it. If I'm photographing my bride, I can walk up to the bride so that her face fills the viewfinder, then press the button, walk back. As long as I keep the button held, I can be confident I'm going to get the same exposure. Now where this falls apart, of course, is if I want to recompose and refocus for my subject moves, and I'm holding the camera and holding this button in, I can't 
easily operate the focus. So there is another way of using this. I can lock my exposure, then take up half pressure on the shutter button, and as long as I maintain that half pressure, it will maintain the auto exposure lock exposure setting. So now I can hold the camera correctly to avoid camera shake, I can refocus, and when I take my picture, it will be with the locked exposure reading. I hope that's clear. Now, of course, there will be situations where there just is not enough light to take a photograph, or perhaps there is too much light. So there are some warnings in the viewfinder, and if we go over to viewfinder cam, it's always difficult to film the viewfinder, in a, in a, but we'll give it our best go. So in normal operation, we see the letter P picked out in the green LED at the top on the right, and we see the aperture of the camera selected picked out in red. In program mode, we have no indication what the shutter speed is if the shutter speed is over a thirtieth of a second. So all we know is we're unlikely to get camera shake. Now if the shutter speed selected drops below a thirtieth of a second, the green P symbol will blink. So that's our camera shake warning. If we are in situations where it's too dark or too bright to take photographs, either the red 32 aperture setting or the red F1 aperture setting will blink. In simple terms, a blinking light in the viewfinder is bad news. It means we have a problem of some kind. You have to remember when you're using the camera what the various blinking lights mean. So that's the program mode. Let's move on to shutter priority. And just before we do that, I'll mention that I've previously made a video on how to install a battery and how to load a film. And I'll link those videos at the end of this one and in the description below. In addition, I've also made a video about using the Motor Drive MA, which does work with the AE1 program. And I'll link, I'll link that video in the description below as well. So if we wish to choose our shutter speed, Let's say we want to freeze some sports action, some football players or something, or we want to choose a slow shutter speed in order to get a light trail or pan with the subject to get a blurry background. We only need to take the shutter speed dial off the program setting and we then have control straight away of the shutter speed range. The camera will choose a complementary aperture. So basically if I'm using a fast shutter speed, the camera will tend towards a wider aperture, a brighter aperture. And if I'm choosing a slower shutter speed, the camera will tend towards a smaller aperture, a darker aperture. So that's pretty straightforward. The exposure lock button will still work, so I can still uh, compensate for those difficult subjects for lighting in just the same way. So that's the shutter speed priority mode. One thing worth noting, the maximum shutter speed on this camera is two seconds. It's two seconds in manual, it's two seconds in shutter speed priority, and in those two modes I'm choosing the shutter speed. But the maximum shutter speed is also two seconds in program mode. And to be honest with you, that's a little bit weird. Most cameras with either aperture priority or program modes will have access to much longer shutter speeds in their automatic exposure modes. So I'm not sure why in program we don't have longer automatic shutter speeds available to us. I was surprised when I read that and I've tried to get this to fire at more than two seconds in, in program and uh, just doesn't happen. There we go. So we looked at program, we've looked at shutter priority. If we press this black stud and move the lens away from the A setting, we've now got control of the aperture and the shutter speed and that is basically full manual exposure mode. Now in manual exposure mode we have a, a light meter in the camera so we can still meter using the camera and again if we look at the viewfinder camera what we see is an aperture value displayed. So as we change our shutter speed the camera will recommend a different aperture. So if we know that we want to shoot at f2.8 we just change our shutter speed until it recommends f2.8. If we know that we want to shoot at a 250th of a second, we just set the aperture the camera recommends in the viewfinder, whatever that may prove to be. Now, as we're doing this, the viewfinder display only lights up when I half press on the shutter button, and that's fine if I'm wanting to change my aperture, but it's a little bit inconvenient to have the viewfinder display go out as I change my shutter speed and then I have to check did that work 
why it's still not recommending F8, Oops, which is what I've got set here. So I need to change my shutter speed as it does recommend F8. So it would be handy if we had a way of operating the light meter without having to press down on the shutter button. And if we remember these two buttons on the side here, the bottom button is our exposure meter preview button. So again, if I'm holding the camera and I want to work with the aperture value, I can just half press the shutter button. That's perfectly convenient. But if I want to work with my shutter speed value, I can press this button then, and that works much, much more conveniently. I can see the display whilst I'm making changes to the shutter speed dial. So you may have noticed on the power switch, there's a third setting. So you've got the A setting, the lock or power off setting, and just down here is the S setting. This is self timer. Uh, should be fairly apparent what a self timer does. We press the button and 10 seconds later it will take a photograph. In the last two seconds it will beep a little bit quicker. There we go. If we use a self timer and we decide that we don't want to take the photograph after all, something's changed in the scene and it's not what we thought it was going to be, we can cancel it by pressing this little black button on the top here. This is the battery test button. So if I push this, if I get a fast beeping, that means I have a good battery. If I get a slow beeping of about three beats per second, uh, the battery's on the wane and will soon need changing, which seems to be the case here. Going back to the self-timer, again, if I want to cancel the self-timer, I can just turn the camera off. And as mentioned before, that completely kills the battery, to, uh, the power to the circuit board. So there's no problem in doing that. There are some limitations to this camera. I've mentioned the limited range of slow shutter speeds in program mode. Now, if you look at the shutter, we can see it's a cloth shutter that travels horizontally. Uh, and let's take a quick look at that in slow motion. Now, horizontal travel cloth shutters in 1981 were becoming uh, a little bit old hat. Many cameras, but as we can see here, we've got a shutter's curtain that travels vertically. Pick a slower speed. And clearly, the distance from here to here is less than the distance from here to here, meaning uh, it takes less time to cover that distance. So on cameras with a vertical plane shutter, we generally see that our top shutter speed is a little faster uh, and our flash synchronization speed is a little faster. So here our flash sync speed is a 60th, whereas even in 1981, a 90th or 125th was very common. And our top shutter speed available to us is 1,000th. And we are seeing cameras come out with a 2,000th uh, and uh, not very long after this, four thousandth of a second. So the shutter design is quite old-fashioned. As I say, it dates to 1976. It's basically the same shutter block as was in the AE-1. Again, this was a, an evolution of the AE-1 rather than a revolutionary new camera. The other thing that people were keen on were the build quality of the camera. Electronic cameras are seen as a little bit new and... Um, People were wary of them. It's one of the reasons the battery test is there, so people can tell when their battery's on the wane. But people like the fact that when they bought this camera, it was a metal body camera with a metal top plate and base plate. But I'm sorry to say it isn't. This, I don't know if you can tell from listening to it, is a polycarbonate or a plastic, as is the base plate. Now on this particular one, for some reason the leading edge of the base plates uh, been chewed away somehow uh, and you can just about see there the plastic showing through but a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, for no particular reason I took the base plate off and shot this little bit of b-roll and as you can see from the internal appearance of the base plate and the way it flexes it's quite clearly not metal.
Now, again, in in the early 80s, there was a belief that uh, black cameras, cameras that were literally painted black, were somehow more professional or better looking. And so you could pay an extra £20 or so and buy this camera in a black finish, which I have to admit does look nicer. Um, but what's often overlooked is that the base plate on the black version of this camera is actually taken from the A1. And on the black version, the base plate is metal. It's a brass base plate. So there were actually two base plates used on this camera. Uh, all these other connectors were basically used for the motor drive and the rewind release pin is just here. Again, I described the use of that in the other video, the film loading video. So we should probably look at this little thing. If you take this cap away, oh, it doesn't come out very easily, and now I've lost it. That's a flash synchronization socket. So if you're using a studio flash or some macro flashes, or we just want to use a flash off camera, that's a very easy and cheap way of doing it. And so it's quite a nice feature to have. And again, seen somewhat as an advanced feature of the camera. Not every camera, certainly at this price point, had a studio flash connect or a pc flash connect now the other advanced feature that people liked about this camera was the depth of field preview and it's this little lever here now depth of field preview was always quite difficult to explain to people in store because what happens is when you press this lever in the lens stops down you can see the lens is closed down to its shooting aperture so in operation if you want to know what's going to be in focus in front or behind the plane of focus just as a quick preview you can press the button and you'll see and when you release the button it resets there is another way of using it if we fold up this little tab and we push the lever in it stays closed and now when I change the aperture I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this you can see that the aperture is changing all the time. So normally for focusing you would focus at maximum aperture but in critical situations where you want to make sure that let's say the fence post in the foreground and the mountains in the background are both going to be sharp you can stop the lens down and see what's going on. Now there are a couple of provisos. If we take a look at the aperture coupling lever, in fact while we do this let's take a look at changing the lens. There's a little silver stud on the base or on the corner of FD lenses if we press that and twist, the lens comes away. To attach a lens, we've got a red dot here and a red dot just up here. We align those and twist the other way. We don't need to hold the button in when we put the lens on. Earlier Canon lenses and third-party FD lenses have a collar. So you would align the red dot on the collar and then instead of turning the entire lens, you would just turn the collar at the back. I don't have one here at the moment to show you, unfortunately. But with the lens off, we can see just here the aperture coupling lever. Now if I set this to f8 and I take a picture, that lever is now at the bottom of its travel, not where it was at the top. And when I wind on, it returns to its resting position. So in terms of using depth of field preview, if I take my picture and then I try and use depth of field preview, it'll only stop down as far as the last picture I took. I have to wind on and reset the aperture coupling lever in order to be able to see the smaller apertures. So just bear that in mind. If you're using this feature, wind on first. This feature only really works in manual mode. So the lens has to be off the automatic setting in order to use depth of field preview. There is a way you can sort of use it in program and shutter priority, and I'll describe that in just a moment. But first, let's look through the viewfinder as we're using depth of field preview. On this little scene, we can see that I focused on the O in auto. And if we look at the word Ashi above the Pentax name, or the word unit on the blue box above it, they are out of focus. At the moment, we're viewing this 
at maximum aperture at f1.8. Now as I stop the lens down you'll notice two things. Firstly the viewfinder gets darker. Now this video camera that I'm filming with is trying to compensate for that so you don't get the full effect of the viewfinder getting darker. Um, but trust me it gets very dim indeed. So we're stopping the lens down. We're stopping the lens down. The first thing you'll notice is the viewfinder gets darker. But just look at that word ashi and the word unit. Around about here both have become acceptably sharp, so we are previewing the amount of depth of field. If we go back to full aperture, we are seeing only what's in focus in the focus plane. So for certain compositions where it's important to have if you photograph uh, a portrait, focus on somebody's eyes, but you want the hands held in front of them to be sharp as well, you can preview that you have that amount of depth of field. Or equally, if you want to make sure the background is sufficiently blurred out, you can preview that and open the aperture up until you get the degree of blurring that you wish for. Now, I said I mentioned how to use this in program or aperture priority. So let's go into program. Program or shutter priority, I beg your pardon. Set that to eight. So in program, as previously mentioned, when I half press the shutter, it will display an aperture. Now if I want to know what amount of depth of field I'm going to get at that aperture, I can set it on the aperture scale, preview my depth of field, and if I'm happy with that, go back into A and take the picture. Now in shutter priority, it does the same thing of course, but we have a little bit more control. So if I choose a fast shutter speed, the camera will choose a wider aperture. So if I look at the display in the viewfinder, and it displays, let's say, f2.8, when I preview that, I might think, hmm, I'd really like more depth of field than that. So what I can do is go back to shutter priority, choose a slower shutter speed, and now it would be, uh, well, let's work it out, 2.8, let's look at the scale, in fact, 2.8456.11. So now it's going to be displaying 11 in the viewfinder. So if I set this to 11 and double check, yes, my viewfinder has gone dark as I do this, but I can see that uh, I've got way more depth of field, which is what I wanted for this photograph. So now when I go back, I can take the picture. That is obviously a little bit convoluted, um, but depth of field preview isn't a feature you would use if you were in a rush, let's say. So other things worth mentioning on this camera, the viewfinder is very bright for the period. So Canon has something called laser matte viewfinders, and it was, most viewfinder glass is sandblasted, uh, or, or roughed up in, the, in a fairly mechanical way. Canon used a laser to cut very fine ridges in the glass for the focusing surface and consequently the um, light transmission across that glass is a lot brighter. Now on this camera the focusing screens are also interchangeable so you see there's a little uh, lever here don't press it. There were a range of uh, focusing screens made there were eight in total including the standard uh, focus screen that came with the camera. Finding these second hand is becoming increasingly difficult. This one is a crosshair which is intended for large magnification, uh, very big telephoto lenses or on a microscope or a telescope for example. The two most popular focus screens in the day were the plain matte where there was no markings at all, no focus aids at all, and the other one that was popular was the grid line that you could line up with window frames or door frames or vertical lines in a building, so that was very handy for architectural use. It's a little bit fiddly to change the focus screen, it's not impossible or difficult, it's just a little bit fiddly, and there are a couple of things to be aware of, so again I will make a separate video about that, because for most people it's not really going to be relevant. So bright viewfinder, interchangeable screens. Uh, the flash system is one of the things about this which um, is a little disappointing. Canon up to, all the way up to the Canon EOS in fact, didn't have, well I suppose the T90, okay. Canon, all the way up to the T90, uh, didn't have TTR flash metering. They didn't have the advanced metering that was common on Minolta, Nikon, Olympus and others. So that's worth bearing in mind.
a little bit of a shame. Uh, even on the A1, it still used a fairly crude auto aperture rather than proper TTL metering. So at this point, I think we've covered all the major features of the camera. Let's have a look at some photographs in a moment. So this first photograph is a slightly out of focus sheep. It was taken on a 500mm f8 mirror lens, also known as a reflex lens. And whilst the sheep's a little bit out of focus, it's quite hard to focus an f8 lens even on the bright viewfinder in the Canon. But it's worth looking at the out of focus detail in the pine tree in the background in the middle. And you'll see there's little round circles. So rather than blurry spots of light, we're getting these donut shaped round circles or donut rings as they're often called. And that's a characteristic of a mirror lens. So here's a little landscape uh, focusing on the foreground interest, the heather, the rock, and we can see that the, the background's out of focus. Uh, next up we have a sort of general scene, and this is a good example of how it's quite hard without using an ND grad, a uh, graduated filter, to balance the landscape and the sky detail together. And there's a similar, uh, similar example on the next image as well. So again, uh, concentrating on the foreground detail, the heather in the foreground sharp, the little valley area behind quite blurry, and the flip side of that, we can focus on the heather in the, in the valley and not in the foreground. Uh, so two complementary pictures. Now here we've gone back to the 500mm lens, uh, and I like to call this picture Ninja Sheep. This little sheep was hiding in the grass and was... Uh, quite tricky to see. But again we've got this uh, interesting defocused look in the blades of grass in the background. Very uh, clearly a mirror lens used here. So the next uh, couple of pictures are different compositions of windswept tree. Again using the shallow depth of field that the 50mm 1.8 allows us to. Now this next photograph was also with the 500mm. When I first saw the image I thought, that sky looks really weird. That's a funny pastel kind of coloured sky. Until I realised of course that it was just the, uh, the fields in the background with some atmospheric haze. So that amused me uh, when I realised that. A little close up of a puddle. Again these aren't exciting photographs, they're not taken to further the uh, artistic creativity of the photographic world. They're just here to illustrate what the what you can expect from the camera. So I think those photographs give a, a reasonable impression of what you can expect from this camera. So that's been the Canon AE-1 program, a very popular camera in 1981 when it was new and that popularity endures till today. If you see one for sale and you're looking for a 35mm SLR camera, well worth considering an AU1 program. They really are good quality, reliable workhorses. Uh, I should mention you may find on some cameras you get a bit of a what's called a Canon shutter cough. It's actually not too bad on this one. So you might find when you trip the shutter there's a little bit of a wheeze or a whine. Generally speaking, nothing to worry about. It's just to do with the lubricants hardening inside. But it won't uh, affect your photographs and all the reliability in any way. Price-wise, these things, because they are popular, are also expensive. If you're very, very lucky, you might find one around 50 to 60 pounds. But typically they're going to be more like 1 to 200 pounds. With the black version being 20 or 30 pounds more expensive. Anyway. That's been the Canon AE-1 program. Thank you so much for watching. I do appreciate it. I hope this has been of interest or use to someone.